don't we go ahead and get started? And uh, got a couple of pretty good cases here for you guys. Some of them, you know, you may not be able to get the instant diagnosis, but if you can at least kind of get it into a, a category, that's that's really mainly what I sort of care about. I'm not sure you're going to be able to come up with an actual diagnosis on this case, but maybe we can. I mean, I can get started. Um, so we have a punch biopsy, um, and it looks like the business is kind of around this hair follicle. Good. Yeah, that's the key. Um. And so, I mean, kind of like a sort of, I mean, almost like nodular infiltrate around it, um, tracks also into the fat around the hair follicle. Um, and then there is some inflammation that looks like around the like adnexal structures as well. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it kind of goes sort of deep here too, that you yeah. mentioned also. What kind of inflammation do you think this is? So it was kind of mixed. Like, I mean, there's, neutrophils there um i think um and then i i think like neutrophils and i think histiocytes yeah no i think you're right i think that some of these cells over here are histiocytes and then these are neutrophils and so and it is mostly a folliculitis so that's one of the nine patterns of inflammatory uh skin disease it's that uh, you know, folliculitis and parafolliculitis. So I think we'd want to start asking ourselves what are some things that can cause inflammation of a follicle? Um, anything going on anywhere else in the specimen, the epidermis or anywhere else? I mean, else? it's like kind of a scant, well, so there is a little bit of parakeratosis. Um, the epidermis, I guess, is a little um, acanthotic too. Yeah, it maybe has yeah. been rubbed a little bit, you know, maybe. Yeah or or something like that. There's a little bit of parakeratosis up here, which is not totally normal. Uh, a little hypergranulosis. And uh, we can okay. see, I can't see, yeah. see too much else in the cornified layer. So what, what's your differential diagnosis when you think of uh, folliculitis, follicular-based inflammatory processes? I mean, you know, you, you can start with like bacterial type folliculitis. Um, I don't think that this looks like that. Um, I was, I was wondering about like other, you know, inflammatory kind of conditions, sort of thinking on like our follicular tetrad type, like conditions. I don't, I, I, I've never seen like, uh, biopsies kind of, I guess, from the scalp for like things like dissecting cellulitis. I actually am not, or like, I'm not sure actually what that, um, would look like necessarily. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. But what about, uh, so you look, and then here's another lesson on these things too. If they give you two pieces on the biopsy, always look at both. Yeah. So is there any finding in this follicle that helps you at all? Um, I mean, there is a hair. Yeah, it's hair um, shaft right there. Yeah, are those bacteria? Or is that, I, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Or is that, <laughs> is that fungi? Yeah, it's fun fungus. Yeah, that's too big of bacteria. Good, it's good, fungus. Good, yeah. Excellent. So yeah, this is this is fungus. Uh, and you can either say fungi or fungi. I was talking about <laughs> fungi, but they're both they're both right. I, I thought it was always fungi because uh, I took mycology in college from a lady who's really good professor in mycology and she pronounced it fungi. So always, I think it depends on what part of the country we were in. I think you're right. So it's either way is fine. But uh, these you can see are the actual uh they're the arthrospores of a dermatophyte that's affected the hair shaft here. And you can see they're actually organisms inside the hair shaft. And then you, if you look out here in the uh, cornified material of the infundibulum and the follicle, they're actually hyphal elements in here. Yeah. So this is a fungal folliculitis. And uh, I was looking up at the cornified layer to see if we had any organisms up here, and I, I don't see any. And that's actually fairly characteristic of uh, some of the organisms that, that like the hair, like trichophyton uh, tonsurans, for example, that affects, you know, kids and whatnot, that only will give you black dock ringworm or whatever what they call it, black dock, you know, tinea capitis. And if you don't mm -hmm. actually find the hair shaft that's affected, you'll miss the diagnosis. So in other words, yeah. if you look at the other piece, um, all we can really say here is that it just basically looks like a separative folliculitis with rupture and uh, could be possibly due to bacterial folliculitis 
but in this case, it was due to fungus. So this is an example of Miyake's granuloma. And um, pretty good example, because if you just get, let's, let's see, you do a two millimeter punch, and they just section maybe to the side of it, they may have to cut through the entire specimen until they find actually a hair shaft that's infected. And if you don't do a, a KOH preparation, you actually have to find an infected hair sh shaft and tease it out and look at that on the slide. If you just kind of scrape the top like up here, uh, it's likely to be negative. So this is a good example of that. Um, now, I would, you know, in the old days, they used to ask a lot of questions about endothrix and ectothrix and that sort of thing. They, I don't know they're going to ask a lot about that today. This would be more of an ectothrix, as you can see all these spores on the outside of the hair shaft. Uh, if you see an endothrix, it's usually on the inside of the, the hair shaft, which is kind of destroyed, but you can get kind of both. Um, the fungi will get into the hair shaft and also do the spores on the outside of the hair shaft also. So it's not just either or. The endothrix uh, infections, as I recall, those are usually the microsporum species like M. canis, M. adwinii, those kind of things, whereas the ectothrix tend to be more of the trichophyton species. So uh, you can review that if you like. Now, you asked a question about uh, what something like, say, a hydridinitis sepurativa or... Yeah, um, well, I, I've like seen HS. I mean, I've seen like sinus tracts and stuff like that for um, specimens. So I, 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 I guess like dissecting cellulitis would probably sort of carry a, a similar type of uh, appearance. Yes, it looks exactly yeah. the same, basically. If what yeah. happens is basically get that infection. Sometimes it's really not even totally an, an infection. You know, it's just the inflammation with inside the hair follicles. Usually the follicles are actually the place where it kind of starts. And then they rupture. And then you just get this sort of diffuse separative and secondary granulomatous inflammation that just kind of marches across the entire specimen, uh, destroys hair shafts, hair follicles, everything in its wake, uh, gives you this horrible scarring alopecia. So it's really a, a terrible kind of process. And it sort of goes along with similar to what the Alex was talking about last night in his talk, basically there's neutrophils, this inflammation just kind of is rampant and just kind of just destroys everything in its path. So it's one of the types of scarring alopecias, but as opposed to like this, alopecia, which usually is not scarring. If you get it, uh, if you treat it properly and, and get rid of it, it'll, the hairs will grow back and there won't have any problem. Uh, but if you get a carry-on or you get something like this and it actually gets secondary separative granulomatous inflammation, destroys follicles, you can get a secondary scarring alopecia from things like this and from bacterial folliculitis sometimes. So you, you want to make sure that you don't let it get to that stage. But that process will just, it's just basically uh, rampant and and uh, just totally kind of destroys everything. So it looks a little bit different. It's not targeting the follicle itself. It just kind of hits everything. So like like in plantar pilaris, whatever, that targets a follicle. It's sort of scarring alopecia, but it's specific for the follicle. Those alopecias just destroy the follicles because they sort of happen to be in their, their way, if you will. They're, they're both scarring alopecias, but different kind of mechanism. That's great. So that's a good example of that. Good, good teaching case. They, they could easily show something like that on, on the exam. This is another one that you probably will get on the exam here. I, in fact, I'm going to be willing to take bets that this will appear on the exam somewhere. It looks like a square punch on scanning. Um, and it looks like some kind of dense, um, either depositional process or Probably depositional. It looks too big for lymphocytes, kind of in the superficial to mid dermis. <coughs> Good. Now we'd like to, you know, we sort of be simplistic in dermatopathology, and I, I think it's better to do that rather than try to get your basic initial sort of approach to be too complicated. But generally, inflammatory and neoplastic, and you say, well, not everything in the world fits in there. You can get hamartomas, you get malformations, you get genetic diseases and whatnot that really aren't truly inflammatory or neoplastics. So they're kind of almost like there's a genetic abnormality that causes the problem. So you have to sort of put that in sort of an asterisk category, if you will. So this sort of is that. You know, this isn't really an inflammatory disease. It's not really a neoplastic disease. But you're right, there is something here. And it looks like, and you said maybe a deposit. So let's take a look. And now what do you see? Yeah, it looks like um, the calcified elastic fibers you see in pseudoxanthoelasticum. Good. And sometimes you basically just have to sort of be able to recognize that. Um, 
So let's say you're writing a multiple choice question and you want to be tricky to your future um, dermatologists that are going to go into training and you're sitting on the board. So you have this slide here and they say, okay, write a question that's going to be reasonable, that's going to uh, cause people to possibly choose some other things. What are some other things you might put in here that might trick a, uh, a test taker besides pseudoxanthin Alaska? Um, you could think about like uh, penicillamine induced um, EPS. It looks like that bramble bush um, kind of pattern, but you don't really see like trans epidermal uh, elimination of elastic fibers in this punch. What I, I would probably argue that that's really not a fair one to put on there because okay. <laughs> that really causes the same type of change. It's just in one case, it's due to genetics. In the other case, it's due to a chemical alteration of the elastic fibers. And if, if you look carefully, usually at a higher magnification, this you can actually see the little sort of spines that come off the side if it's penicillamine induced. Um, you don't have to get the transepidermal elimination. You usually do. Um, but you can have a biopsy of that that doesn't show the transepidermal elimination. In fact, they could even get that same kind of calcification of the elastic fibers in internal organs where there's no epidermis to transepidermally go across. Uh, I have a patient of mine that I've been following now for probably about 25 years who has the penicillamine induced, he had oxalosis, uh, kidney problems with that. And they gave him penicillamine and it treated his oxalosis, but he got the, the penicillamine induced PXE and he's had some transepidermally eliminated areas there, but he has other areas that aren't. But he also has cardiac involvement. The elastic fibers of his heart were involved, and in his larynx were involved. So he has a chronic hoarseness. Uh, but there's no transepidermal elimination of those, obviously. So you don't necessarily, that's not a criterion for diagnosis. It, it is the bramble bush morphology, uh, but it'd be very difficult to see on this. So this is probably the genetic type. But what other things would you put in there besides that that might? trick you up or trick somebody else up? Um, I mean, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still on the side of... Uh, you're not, you're not mean enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think somebody might possibly think this might be, say, uh, ochronosis? You know, obviously it's, it's altered elastic fibers, so you might put in there acquired ochronosis might say, well, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, the elastic fibers are screwed up here. Maybe that's going on here. Uh, what if you put in calciphylaxis? They might say, well, yeah, there's calcification. Um, you know, there's definitely calcium in here. So maybe it's uh, the elastic fibers just getting calcified because the patient's got an abnormal calcium phosphate product. So that's something you might throw in here. Could these possibly look like organisms? What if you put in here something like uh, fusarium? Or something like that, you know, it's like, wow, don't these kind of look a little bit like hyphae? Um, they got little holes, you know, they, they maybe they're actually uh, fungi. Fun, fungi. <laughs> so just think of terms of things that somebody might put in here to kind of screw you up when you're studying for the exam, because uh, that's helpful, because that, that's, they're going to have, if this were a multiple choice, they would probably put some things, something analogous to that in there to try to cause you to, to, you know, make a, a erroneous choice. Now, the other thing they might, they would likely do is they might put this on there. So this is so easy that everybody ought to figure, ought to be able to recognize the pattern, um, the so-called steel wool appearance. They might say, if you wanted to do a special stain to confirm the diagnosis, what would you do? So what special stain would you recommend to demonstrate the calcium in these elastic fibers here? Vancosa for calcium or VVG. Good, good. Vancosa stain for calcium. VVG would demonstrate that they're elastic fibers. Um, is this a pathognomonic finding of patients with PXE? This is a more difficult question now. So what are some other settings where you can see PXE-like changes of the elastic fibers, but the patients don't have PXE and they haven't been taking penicillamine? That's more of a second or third year question. They can get gammopathies, I think. Yeah, but what about the actual appearance of the PXE-like histology? So I show you these, these calcified elastic fibers look like steel wool. You look and say, oh, patient got PXE. And then you see the, the clinical impression. It's a solitary papule um, in a 50-year-old uh, woman near the umbilicus.
Oh, I know there's a name for this that I cannot remember. <laughs> well, you can get localized isolated PXE-like changes um, in areas, say, where the skin has been really severely stretched, like in, in multiple pregnancies. Um, we see that not uncommonly. Sometimes you'll see PXE-like elastic uh, tissue changes in, in some of the sclerosing disorders. Occasionally, you'll see little areas like this, say, in necrobiosis like poetica, uh, things like that. So you can see, uh, just know that it can be a reaction pattern sometimes, too. So they don't always have to have uh, the classic genetic PXE to get this or even have exposure to penicillamine. So sometimes you can actually get PXE-like changes um, in those settings. So it'd probably be interesting to you might read up on that just to sort of see some of the settings where you can see it. I think we published on that a number of years ago. I uh, had a couple of case reports of that. And the last question they would probably ask you is, what's the genetic problem? They might show you this. This patient has widespread eruption with, they might even show you a picture of the chicken flesh type of morphology around <laughs> the neck or whatever, or the Brooks membrane uh, break in the eye, something like that. And they'd ask you, what's the genetic abnormality? It's ABCC6. Good, good. So just make sure you know that because they love to ask it. Whenever they get the genetics, they always somewhere ask it on the exam. Okay. Now, something a little bit different. Give a shave biopsy with. Um, what well, looks this like a shave. This guy gets an award for uh, maybe a uh, punch. <laughs> CrossFit, you know, he's <laughs> about a centimeter across here. So, is it an excision? Yeah, yeah, yeah. excision, excision. Um, there's a neoplasm, it looks like, in the upper dermis, um, heavily pigmented, it looks like, so I think there are probably a lot of melanophages, and then kind of zooming in, I think I um, mostly see melanocytes, and some are spindled looking, so I was thinking like a blue nevus or a, a deep penetrating nevus, I don't know how to differentiate between those two actually on path. Okay, let's look at a couple of other areas here. What's going on over here, right in this area? Um, it looks like maybe, I'm not sure, some spongiosis maybe of the basal layer, and then the collagen looks quite, um, I think quite thick, and I think those are okay. also. Yeah, there's these fibroblasts here. It's thick in collagen. So if I just showed you this without all the other stuff, what would you say this is going, this is right here? Um, like fi something fibrosing happening in that area. Uh, that and what's the most common sort of fibrosing thing that we see very commonly in all of us when we skin our knee or get cut or something like that? Like it's, scar? Scar, yes. So this is just scar tissue, okay? And it's, you know, over here you can see that it's it's very localized. Is this so, a current nevus then or? Well, let's, so there's a scar. And then, so what's the differential diagnosis of pigmented cells in the dermis? So you're, you, you said that these are melanocytes, okay? Is could, there anything could else be, I could be? Like hemocytorin. Could be siderophages. Yes. And how do you tell those apart? I think the hemocytorin tends to be like, more granular and I think they're more like even sized or I think the melanin is supposed to be like more chunky. Well, what is hemosiderin actually? Like the byproduct of broken down RBCs? Yes. And then and then what is the actual substance hemosiderin? Is it a, I mean, you don't have to know the biochemical formula of it, but what what would you call it? Is it a, an element? Is it a molecule is it what's what does it contain what's the heme. Is there, and what does heme contain iron yes iron so it's basically a ferrous or ferric i don't know the exact uh you know chemical compound either but it's it's an it's an iron containing molecule and molecules often are crystalline you know like salt especially if they're solid form so if you look at them under the microscope, they're usually golden brown, and you can actually um, see that they're refractile. So that's one of the disadvantages of having an image, because if you actually have a slide, you can rack down the condenser and you can kind of uh, take your 
you know, focus and go up and down on that a little bit. And you can see that there's actually refractility. The light actually, you know, is refra refracted through a crystal. Melanin, on the other hand, it's also a molecule also, but it's a long chain, you know, uh, substance and, and it is not refractile. So melanin is jet black and, and it's, it's almost like a dye in a way. So it, it's not refractile at all. And you look at it really carefully, see these fine little granules usually, whereas these are more golden brown, uh, yellowish, if you will, whereas melanin is, is more sort of light brown or even sometimes blackish. And they look different. So these are, look at this thing here. Look at that big giant clump of blackish material there. That, that's obviously not melon, right? That's, that's like a, a chunk of something. And if you were to look at some of these areas over here, they're also going to be more refractile globular as opposed mm -hmm. to fine granules. So this is mostly iron containing material here. Oh, all right. So what this is, this is scar from a previous biopsy. It's an excision of, I think this may have been a squamous cell or something. And so when you excise, when you do a biopsy, um, what do you do when you get, before you put the, the bandage on the patient? Now there's two things you can do. There's well, three things you can do, but what do you usually do before you put the bandaid on so the patient doesn't go out and come back five minutes later bleeding? Like aluminum chloride or? Aluminum chloride. There's a couple of other things that, that used to be used a lot. And a lot of dermatologists still have this in their office. Anybody know what that is? I don't know. cell solution, which is ferrous subsulfate. It's an iron, like hemosiderin. And if you put that on, it also is really good styptic. And they used to use this a lot in the old days. When I was training in dermatology, they, that's really, we use that. We had just started using aluminum chloride. Uh, it really wasn't used a lot. I was about the first <laughs> group of residents who started using aluminum chloride. It's not as good as, as Moncel's, by the way. If you've ever used Moncel's, I mean, it really stops the bleeding just almost immediately. You got to sit there and kind of dab the fair, you know, the aluminum chloride off for about a, a minute or so. And it's not quite. Yeah, as but, good. but then Moncel's does this. <laughs> What's that? But then Moncel's gives you a tattoo. <laughs> you know, it sometimes can. Yeah, it sometimes can. That's one of the reasons why people quit using it because occasionally you get a Moncel's tattoo and it wouldn't go away. And then this is another reason. Some, I've seen biopsies like this, post biopsy, apply Moncel, gets re-excised, goes to a general pathologist and they call it melanoma. <laughs> they, they don't really know what this looks like. They think it's melanocytes like you did. And uh, it's just, you kind of have to be able to recognize this. And look at this right here. There's another example. That's iron containing material. You can see that kind of yellowish brown right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Giant clump here. So this is this is an example of a Moncel's artifact. Uh, they show artifacts on the exam also every now and then. So you, you may get this uh, for that very reason, because they don't want you to look at something like this and call it a melanoma. And you want to make sure if you see something like this, you look at, uh, the rest of the clues, the fact that there's obviously a scar here, and this stuff is is kind of all present around the scar. Now, there's one other setting where you can see something that kind of looks similar to this. It's not a Moncel's artifact, where you get a lot of hemosiderin, a lot of large fibroblasts, uh, histiocytes that often engulf hemosiderin and keloidal collagen at the periphery. Who knows what that, what is, read my mind on that diagnosis. Hemosiderotic DF. Good, excellent. One of the cellular DFs has got hemocytorin in it, aneurysmal DF. Uh, those can sometimes also simulate melanocytic lesions. So, so that's good. Okay. Now we got another artifact here. Okay. Um, well, this is also a big excision. Yep. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, there's kind of this like sclerotic sort of look to the cells. I mean, uh, the collagen. <clears throat> yeah, here's your original right procedure. Here. So yeah. here's the biopsy, and this is the, the excision of it. So let's take a look over here. Okay. What's going on here? Uh, that looks like some very stringy sort of material. <laughs> Stringy purple material. 
Is that what you're talking about? Is this the stringy purple material? Yeah, sort of. Okay, good. It is stringy purple. What kind of stringy purple material is it? Mm. Are those actually keratinocytes? I can't actually tell. Yeah, yeah. They are. Here's a keratin. These keratinocytes are fine. No problem. And then we get into, here's one. Here's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then over here, actually kind of is full thickness over here. It's actually necrosed over here. A little hmm. blister right there. Um, well, I've seen this more in frozen sections on those, but I don't know. Okay, that's talking. one That's one item in the differential diagnosis. Good. So here's, the, here's your question. Okay, A. Uh, freeze artifact. Yeah. You going to choose that? No, I think freeze has more like the halo look to the carrots and the sites Good. rather than this. Excellent. Excellent. What are we seeing here? What is this phenomenon that we're looking at right here? Mm, the actual name for it. I, I think it's from cautery, but I don't know the name for it. It is electrocautery. And why are these cells being kind of almost pulled? They are actually being pulled. It's going, it's just being pulled north. Here's your electric needle up here. These things are going, whoa, they're, they're kind of going towards it. It's like a so magnet. What's actually happening there? Is it, it's almost like a magnetic force. Like yeah. Up. yeah, exactly. It's almost like electrophoresis in a way. You know, you've got electricity that's, that's actually probably the, the real, um, they wanted to stop the bleeding over here. Okay, so they probably... We're really, really electrocauterizing this area pretty dramatically. And this is some of the residual electricity that kind of goes out for a millimeter or so away from that. And so these, these, this DNA, the nucleic acid sitting inside the uh, nuclei here, it's polarized, obviously. It's an acid. So it's being pulled just like almost kind of electrophoresis towards that electric. It's like a magnet, very much so. And so the fact that these cells are elongated like this tells you that this is it's pathognomonic of electrocautery artifact versus um, like freeze artifact, for example. So that's something that they could put on the exam if they wanted to sort of test your ability to recognize um, a, an artifact. Another thing they might put on here would be like maybe application of an irritant. Like an irritant let's say a, a chemical irritant. What would that look like? Uh... I don't know if it would be um, keratin. I think it would probably look more like a, a acute spongiotic process, maybe. Well, usually what happens is it's really and truly like a, a, a florid irritant reaction. Let's say something like an acid. Like let's say you put uh, hydrochloric acid on somebody's skin and it just kind of instantly kind of burns it quickly. Or, or if you're putting on like say uh, 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 something like one of the a BCA or something like that to like freeze off or burn off like a, a wart or something like that. It causes a coagulation necrosis of the entire epithelium just almost immediately. So you get this sort of, you get something that would look more kind of like this throughout the full thickness of the epithelium. You wouldn't get any polarization of the nuclei like this at all. And you don't usually get the halo. So it just kind of instantly sort of kills everything. It's almost like it just, just wipes it out almost just like a like quick death and it just kind of coagulates the whole thing. So freeze artifact uh, gives you the little vacuoles, like you said, if you're freezing like at Mohs, this gives you the polarization uh, of the nuclei, and then a coagulation necrosis gives you the whole full thickness. Of course, you get other kind of change in the epidermis, like ballooning degeneration. Cells fill up with liquid. Uh, obviously, spongiosis, epidermal hyperkeratosis, some of those other reaction patterns we've talked about. But this is more exogenous, coming from outside the body into the body. And then if you get an excoriation, you can see coagulation necrosis also. But you'll also, it's usually usually from top down or you'll get like a confluent, uh, like an ulcer and erosion and you'll get alteration of the cornified layer. Some of these other changes, you may leave the cornified layer intact. So that is an electrocautery artifact. So that's that's possible uh, exam question. I'll not ask you that. Okay. Let's do this piece over here. This is a good example here. I think this is a, a nice example. So this is one, if you work through your uh, diagnostic criteria, you should be able to come up with a diagnosis here. I can try this one. Um, so it looks like um, this is a punch. 
and that there is a vacuolar interface pattern. There's also um, somewhat dense inflammation too. You could think like lichenoid, um, but just seeing kind of the vacuolar pattern with the disc keratotics in the epidermis kind of made me lean more toward that. There's um, also a little bit of like um, superficial perivascular um, infiltrate. I think it's mostly lymphs, but I thought I saw some EOS too. Oh, and I guess plasma cells. I don't know um, if seeing too many plasma maybe cells. Maybe not. Okay, sorry, it's kind of fuzzy. That is uh, really EOS. Now be, beware of that because most of these are extravasated red cells here. Mm. And that's kind of a that's kind of an important finding, obviously, the fact that those are there and the fact that you do not see eosinophils here. Gotcha. Um, and then there's also a little bit of um, parakeratosis. Good, good. What pattern of the parakeratosis do you see here? Um, well, it's para and then overlying it, there's a little bit of um, just like basket weave. Yeah, <laughs> but good. This would, so what does that tell you about this, the uh, rapidity of development of the lesion here? I think it's a little bit more acute. Very acute. Yeah, extremely acute. So this is such an early lesion because it's still got the basket weave cortified layer, probably wouldn't even be scaly yet. So this is, this is probably like just a few days old, actually. So it's really interesting that it's usually you don't see basket weave cornified layer in this condition. Um. So I was thinking um, this could, and then also at the top, I wasn't sure, but I wasn't sure if this would be like follicular plugging at all at the top, just that area where there's a little bit of a divot with para. I didn't think it was major follicular plugging, but it was just something that I, I wasn't sure about. Yeah, I don't really see too many follicles here. I Usually if you see follicular plugging that you can really identify, you'll see a nice follicle with an infundibulum that's filled with uh, a thick, usually ortho and parakeratotic cornified layer, no basket weave. Normally, if you look at an infundibulum of follicle, it's basket weave cornified material. But if it's got uh, parakeratosis or hyperkeratosis within there, uh, then it's it's follicular plugging. So I, I don't I agree. I don't really see that either here. Okay. Um, but I was kind of leaning toward pleva for this one. Good. You <laughs> leaned in the right direction. That's good. So this has every feature almost. It, it, it's missing a couple of minor things, but it may be because it's such an early lesion. Um, usually pleva does not have the basket weave, but notice that it's got this broad zone, this almost wafer of parakeratosis with some neutrophils in it. So when you see patients that have pleva, they usually have a very crusty uh, appearance to the surface of the lesion. It usually doesn't have a basket weave cornified layer. So it's, if you feel patients that got pityriasis lichenoides, it feels rough. It doesn't feel smooth. It, it feels, you know, scaly and crusty in a way. It's not, and it's not like the type of branny scale you get with uh, tinea versicola. It's got a kind of a crusty appearance to it. And that's because it's got the serum and the neutrophils and the broad zone of parakeratosis in here. It's got the interface dermatitis that you noted quite nicely, the vacuolar alteration. It's got lots of dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Extravasated erythrocytes are a common finding uh, in pederysis lichenoides. And one thing that you do not see, this is one of the few things that's pretty close to a uh, almost guarantee, if you will, uh, is eosinophils. So if you see eosinophils in what looks like pederysis lichenoides uh, every, every other way, you should pull back and say, well, maybe it's really not true PLC or, P or PLEVA. Maybe it's more likely uh, epiterosis like, you know, like drug eruption, for example, or make sure it's not lymphomatoid papulosis, where you can get eosinophils. Uh, and it can look a lot like, there's some of the forms that can look like lichenoid and look a little bit like epiterosis lichenoides. So uh, the one, there's, there's, there's several different forms of epiterosis lichenoides. And All right, did you say pleva, or did you say LYP for the EOS? Uh, that what you said? LYP, you can get uh, EOS, but not okay. pterygeal lichenoides. Not PLS. Okay. Thanks. In any of the pterygeal lichenoides, if you see things, it looks like it. And you see EOS, back off. Say, wait a minute. It may not be that. It may be a PLC like drug eruption. It may be, you know, LYP, something like that. So if I misspoke, I, I apologize. So there's several different types of pterygeal lichenoides, and I don't like when when we use, um, you know, acuteness or chronicity to uh, make a diagnosis, for example. 
because you can get some patients that have pterodactylogenoides that goes on for you know 20, 30 years, and they can develop acute lesions along that way. Well, do you just suddenly call them pleva if they've got it for chronic a long period of time? So not really. And then you can get people that have like classic eruptive pterodactylogenoides, where it looks more like pterodactylogenoides chronic histology, where it looks kind of, you know, this one doesn't have the superficial and deep wedge-shaped infiltrate that we classically see with the variola-form type of pleva. And if you've ever seen a patient with that, that's really and truly got the, the, the Muka Haberman, the, the, the variola-formis type, and it's called variola form because it looks like smallpox. Uh, they're really, really sick, and they're often seen in kiddos. Um, they can get high fever. Um, they often have to get admitted to the hospital. They need to be placed on methotrexate, um, things like that. So that's really the classic sort of pleva form. And Occasionally, those can even be fatal. So this would be maybe a more of a probably an acute lesion, but it doesn't have the classic really superficial and deep dense infiltrate that we see sometimes in that. So there's a big spectrum of this disease, but it really shows some of the nice. This is really a good good example of it right here. It shows pretty much everything that you you like to see. So that's good that you were able to pick that up. Okay, let's take a look at this one. All right, this one's also, I think, uh, should be able to at least come up with the differential here. Okay, I can go. Um, so this one's another punch biopsy. Um, what part of the body? Probably acral skin. Good. Um, I was also considering like, could this just be hyperkeratotic somewhere else? But I went with acral. Um, yeah, well, good. And there's no follicles at all. Yeah. So that that would help you with that. So it may it could but be like the back that they've rubbed or something. But I I like acral also. Yeah. So this is like, I mean, it's more just it looks purely lichenoid. Um, good. I don't really. I mean, if we dive in, um, but I, I, I didn't really see like evidence of like a vacuolar process. Is it lichen planus? No. The lichenoid, obviously, we think. No, it's not. It looks like lichen planus. So it's, so it's. I mean, it doesn't have like this sawtooth thing kind of pattern. It's got a little um, bit of that here, though. I mean, I guess it, it could be, I guess, then. <laughs> what? But, but you're right, it's not. But I'm trying to get you to say why it's not. What else is bad for lichen planus here? Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure the location would be very good for it. You get lichen plants on palms and soles. Okay. I'm just Absolutely. Um, what else? What's the um, main reason that you, you, you know what it is, you're just not saying it. What about the cells in the infiltrate? Are those all uh, lymphocytes? Oh, no, it was, I no. Think it was more mixed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it couldn't all be lymphocytes. They're not just jet black. And you see yeah. a classic feature of LP. I mean, it looks like a black band-like infiltrate. And then if you can still see the epidermis, unless it's, you know, really dense, you will see the sawtooth thing and wedge-shaped hypergranulosis, which you really don't have too much of that here. Maybe a little bit, but not much. But I agree. I mean, this this doesn't, I mean, it, it's lichenoid. I totally agree with that, but it does look like classic lichen planus. So when you see a lichenoid infiltrate that doesn't look like LP, um, what are some things you start thinking about? Um, I mean, other like lichenoid things that you think about, like, um, well, it's, it's not going to be like a BLK because it's not like a shave biopsy and there isn't like a, you know, other changes that would suggest that, um, you think about some, like, some guys, believe it or not, punch everything. <laughs> and so they could punch in a BLK. So theoretically it could be that. I mean, I agree. It's it not be, that. That would also be a weird location. I think. Yeah, totally. Um, I agree completely because that's a solar lenigo with infiltration. Yeah. The volar's going to be bad for that. And you don't really see evidence of a solar lenigo here at all. So I, I agree. That's yeah. it's not a BLK. Um, think about like lichenoid drug. I didn't, I, I was looking for EOs. Um, I don't see any, any but, EOs. Yeah. What kind of um, cells do you see here? So, I mean, there are lymphocytes and then like histiocytes. Yes, good. There's lots of histiocytes here. Yeah. Lots. So this is a pattern of lichenoid granulomatous infiltrate. 
Yeah. And like, um, I mean, I know like when you sort of cross patterns, you want to like rule out syphilis. Yeah. You always want to rule out syphilis. That's one of the ones that can do this pattern, by the way. So when you, it's a, it's a small differential like an granuloma. So you always put syphilis in there. What else goes in there? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think about what else. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to that. Uh, do you remember that Grand Rounds case from a month ago or so? Where they yeah. had like, it was a weird like drug, drug induced. Like Yeah. And if you, if you want to get, be right all the time, you can say drug because it's drug. <laughs> Um, let's see. I think MF is on that different. MF, MF is definitely on there. There's not too many. That, that's the, the, the good thing about it is really not a whole lot to think of. So yeah, syphilis, drug, mycosis fungoides, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which those are more Langerhans cells really than histiocytes, but that can do it. Um, there's a form of perineoplastic persistent permitted preferred dermatitis, or then not always have to be perineoplastic, but if you get a granulomatous PPPD, they can give you a lichen or granulomatous pattern like this, which is fairly uncommon. Occasionally, Hansen's can give you this pattern sometimes. And that's kind of pretty much it. I mean, there's really not a lot. Um, if you wanted to sort of get a little bit loose, you could maybe throw in a verusiform xanthoma because that fills the papillary dermis with foamy histiocytes in a way. But that's not truly like this. So you got a relatively limited differential here. Uh, and one of them is not lichen planus. It's not usually that. I mean, lichen nitidus gives you, but it's a really focal uh, infiltrate. Sometimes lichen striatus can give you a little bit of a granulomatous inflammatory infiltrate. So was there any other cell in here that might tip you one way or another? Obviously there is, or I wouldn't have asked it that way. Like that cell right there, for example. Sorry, it's a little blurry on me. Yeah, I know these. Um, this is why these. Oh, images, there's a plasma images, cell there. A lot of plasma cells. Yeah. There. So this one was, and it's also palm and soul. Diagnosis was syphilis here. This is secondary Louis. So this is the just a nice example. So there's there's a bunch of different histologic patterns of syphilis. Um, if you wanted to like wake somebody up at three in the morning and say, hey, I've got this biopsy, a superficial and deep psoriasis lichenoid pattern with you know, plasma cells and histiocytes. So that's the classic pattern for secondary syphilis. But I've seen some look almost identical to pitoriasis lichenoides. I've seen some look very much like psoriasis. I've seen some just look like a very sparse infiltrate, almost like pitoriasis rosea histologically as well as clinically can look like pitoriasis rosea. So it can give you lots of patterns. Look like sarcoid, uh, look like lichen planus. So it really and truly is the big imitator vasculitis. There's lots of different forms of secondary syphilis. But this is a nice example of, of a, didn't have the superficial deep pattern. It just had the lichenoid pattern. So if you think lichenoid granulomatous, um, always think of, of syphilis. Okay. You guys have time for one more or do you need to head off to clinic? I'm driving, but I can do one more. I mean, I can listen if, I need, if anyone else can go. <laughs> I can do the next one. If you need. You're, you're driving and you're doing histology. <laughs> I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> well, I can do this one since Kish is driving. <laughs> I guess it's um, like listening to a TV show on the radio. <laughs> this is a great case. Okay. It looks, um, so I think it's an excision. Yeah, it's an excision. It's really, it's really massive. Um, it looks like kind of I would guess the, the cells are pale on scanning. So maybe like a histiocytic or granulomatous process. And yeah. what's really striking is that really the basophilic kind of um, centered, the histiocytes are kind of around. Um, yeah. That looks like, it looks like a grain, like um, from botryomycosis. And the, the infiltrate looks kind of like dense neutrophils I see around it and kind of, I don't know if that like pink surrounding is that the, the slender hoppy phenomenon but uh possibly now you just kind of jumped to the diagnosis of okay. psychosis and why why did you instantly go I, there i think in my mind the dark the basophilic like the grains just look like that to me versus calcium but i think it looks more like the grains plus all the the um, inflammation around it a favorite botryomycosis well you can get that so Really, if you're going to make a diagnosis of botrya, what are, what's in the differential of, bot, of grains in the skin? Let's just go there. So what are, what are some of the organisms that can cause grains? 
Well, first, Botryoma would be a staph. Botryoma is one, and that's that's routine bacteria. Um, and then I guess you could think about fungus, so like eumycetoma. Yes, eumycetoma. Now, does this out here, these little sort of almost strand-like structures here and almost kind of forming a web of organisms here, does that look like staph to you? Um, it, you're, I feel like you're leading me to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am leading you to know. So notice, usually if you see Botryo, it, it, it's kind of almost like you just get little round gram positive organisms that are just cemented together and they're, they're round. It looks almost like kind of a, a, a little beady, if you will. This, notice, it's got these sort of fine feathery sort of uh, structures that are kind of radiating from this. And here you've almost got kind of a gossamer. Uh, these are also organisms here that are kind of forming this little web-like structure that have kind of coalesced to form a grain. So what other organism that's a bacterium yeah, Gram positive it, bacterium. Is it a filamentous um, bacterium? So yeah, like actinomyces. Yeah, actinomyces. So this is actinomycosis. So this isn't botryo. Botryo usually, uh, the cases that I've seen, they don't go this deep. They're not usually this many, and they're usually um, just a couple of little grains up in the reticular dermis in the upper reticular dermis. They don't. This is this would be like botryomycosis on massive doses of systemic steroids. I mean, it's really way too deep and way too many. And so this is this is a, a nice example of actinomycosis. Now they both give basophilic um, structures here because they're both gram positive. Actinomyces is a gram positive organism also. I mean, some I used to think it was a fungus, but I think now that most people recognize it as being a variation of a filamentous bacterium. And uh, I, I would say that the key to this is number one, the fact you've got so many of these grains here. Number two, it's obviously not eumycetoma of any of those. Number three is those little fine filamentous structures that I demonstrated before that you don't usually see in Botryo. Uh, now there's a couple of scenarios where you see this. Where are the most common situations where you see actinomycosis? There's two main ones. Immunocompromised patients is one. And how are they usually immunocompromised? Um, it's not really common, let's say, with patients with HIV infection or that sort of thing, actually, interestingly enough. There's one okay. disease that's really associated with it when it occurs it, on the trunk in that situation. Hmm. On the trunk. Is it, it's not organ transplant? I know they get lung symptoms with, or do they? Well, there, I'm there's thinking about it's pulmonary alveolar proteinosis that's associated with, um, with this condition sometimes and no cardi. I think this condition also can be associated with with PAP. But the other one is, is just dental sinus infections um, will often, often get uh, actinomycosis. So lumpy jaw, you know, that setting, uh, they'll often get like somebody gets a, a tooth abscess and at the top of that, they'll develop actinomycosis and then the thing drains and then it gets into this situation. It takes forever to heal and they go in and excise it. And this is kind of what it looks like. So I don't remember the setting where this was, uh, looks like this is near volar skin, so it may have been some kind of traumatically induced situation, but this was a case of actinomycosis. So I'd recommend boning up on your grains, boning up on the things like, you know, prothecosis. You know, that's basically the eight chlor chloric algae that you can give it, uh, give you the, you know, clusters of organisms in the skin. It looks like the mulberry cells doesn't really give you grains. No cardia, make sure you look at those. So that's something the board likes to ask about also too. Okay, hope this was fun for you guys this morning. Uh, any feedback Thank if you, you have any? All right, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. You bet.